And over my career, I've been challenged many times on the value that UX research brings to product decision making. At best, this can be an interesting conversation, but at worst, it's a frustrating stalemate. So I wanted to improve the value of UX research in a more informed and thoughtful way. So I did a bunch of research, of course, and uh, that's what I'm gonna share with you today. So we'll start with one of those many models that represents design, uh, the double diamond. Uh, this is a very simple version of it as well, but it represents the point. We've got the problem space and the solution space. The diamond shape comes because we start with quite a little bit of knowledge at the beginning, and as we learn more, we scale out, we diverge out into that bigger part of the diamond. And then as we define the problem that we're working with a bit more, we narrow down, and same in the solution space. We start with no solutions, ideally, and then we expand out and then come back down when we're refining and testing and iterating and all of that. So of course there's movement between these, these things, and I've definitely simplified the process quite a lot. But generally that's kind of the process that we follow. Well, in theory, I find in practice that a lot of people really want to skip that first diamond in order to start here, at the solution space. People want to gloss over designing the, the right thing in order to get stuck into designing the thing right. I thought back over my career and I listed all the excuses that I've heard people give me for this behavior. So raise your hand if you've had any of these excuses before. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So in classic UX fashion, I did some grouping and theming on these, and I found they kind of fit into two distinct themes. The first theme is the kind of underlying attitude that UX research is just not a valid or worthwhile activity. People in tech often have a love affair with data, and they question, what extra value can UX research give me over that? The second theme is a temptation to start with the solution. It's bypassing the need to understand the people that you're building for in favor of speed to deliver the product. So I wanted to know how I might convince stakeholders that UX research is valid research and that we must start with an understanding of our customers and our problems first. UX research has come from a wide variety of academic practices. For some, like anthropology, human factors, psychology, human-computer interaction, just to name a few. Academic research has a lot of different constraints to industry research, for sure, but there's a lot we can learn from looking to where our practices originate from. If we can be more informed about why we do UX research the way that we do, then we can better fight for the customers at the heart of our product. So let's jump to that first group of excuses, that underlying assumption that UX research is just not that valid. So when I was thinking about when I'd heard people say things like, oh, you're just going to talk to a person and it's just a bit subjective, you know, it's just their opinion. I realized that I was always getting these critiques when I was doing qualitative discovery research. Quantitative research is everywhere. We learn it in high school science class. Uh, there's articles all over the place quoting statistics. And technical education tends to leave out qual methods. So how do we prove the value of our qualitative research in this quant-saturated world? We need to have a clear understanding of why we do research the way we do so that we can explain it to people. So let's just start with a really quick definition of quantitative and qualitative, just in case you're not super familiar. Quantitative research seeks to quantify experiences into numbers. Qualitative research seeks to describe experience with qualities or descriptions. Quantitative me methods um, tell us what people do, and qualitative methods tell us why people do it. And of course we use both in UX research, but I'm focusing on more of that discovery qual side. These people who question the validity of our qualitative research seem not to understand the difference between qual and quant. Now these two, they're really good friends, but they're very different. Quant can often feel like it is more unscientific because it reduces concepts to numbers. There's cognitive ease there. Qual is by nature so much more messier the results are harder to comprehend. It's rich descriptions. It kind of forces you to think from other people's perspectives, which can sometimes cause some cognitive friction. The issue lies where people try to shoehorn the qualitative methods that we do into the quantitative framework that they're familiar with. By doing this, 
they feel like qualitative research is maybe a bit more scientific, but it's not. It just stops us from doing our research effectively. So, qual and quant are really different. They have a fundamental different assumption about the world itself. Quantitative makes the assumption that the world objectively exists without anyone there to observe it, so that our, the truth exists outside of ourselves. For example, do my slides here exist if none of you are here to observe it? Well, maybe. If so, then we're assuming that reality is fixed. If reality is fixed, then we can measure that reality. So if we can know these things, then that's the purpose of our research. The purpose of the research is to seek to find that truth and then describe it with rules or laws. And this is the view that quantitative research, oh yeah, seems to take a bit more. The opposite assumption is true um, for subjective reality, that things only exist based on our perceptions of them. So different people will have a different version of the truth. You're all experiencing this presentation I'm giving, but are you all listening to the same things? Are you perceiving the same things? If reality is subjective, then we can never really know the true nature of the world, only every person's unique interpretation of it. If this is the case, then our purpose of research is to deeply understand different interpretations of the world. Then we can maybe find some common ground or shared experiences. And this is the view that qualitative research takes. So, those are quite fundamentally different ways of viewing the world. The purpose of our research is either identifying an objective truth or understanding multiple subjective experiences. This determines how we approach our research on a base level. So I have a product team that I was working with, and they wanted to understand how small business customers manage their finances. So we ran six discovery sessions and some analysis to form a focus area for their path forward. After the research, the team confronted me and said, were the results valid? I mean, we only talked to six people. What about all the other people that are on our customer base? So they were really worried that we're only representing a small percentage of their customer base. They were putting qual methods into the quant framework that they're familiar with. Quantitative research has to seek signif statistical significance because the purpose of quantitative research is to find the truth and create laws. It needs to be certain about its results because the results indicate a fact about the world. In qual, we're looking for a richness of data rather than a statistically representative sample size because we don't think that we can understand the truth about the world, only ever those people's interpretations. So we need to dive deeper, not broader. Of course, we still want to ensure that we have represented different groups and that we're not getting an outlier, but we don't need to use the quant style measures of success for this. So my product team were worried that we hadn't interviewed enough people to represent all of their customers. But the people we did talk to were representative of what we were looking for. We had the different industries and the different usage behaviors that we were targeting. And we interviewed less people than the quantitative measures of success look for, but we got the rich quality of data that we look for as success in qual research. We understood the why. So UX research is valid research if you focus on what makes qualitative research successful and you don't force quant metrics onto it. So let's jump into that second group of successes, the pervasive obsession with starting with a solution. So I found when people were saying these things, it's because they believed that they actually already knew their customers. So they're like, ah, oh, we won't learn anything new. Oh, my dad runs a small business. I know everything about it. Stuff like that. So what can we do about these people who just want to start with the solution space? We need to be strong in our own understanding of how to move between the problem and the solution space, so we can convince stakeholders who want to move quickly to solutions the value of exploring our customers and our problems first. I find that when people believe that they understand their customers enough already, they're using single points of secondary data. It's usually quite ad hoc and anecdotal, like the classic MPS verbatims or a collated staff feedback. And those things can be really great starting points to research further with qualitative and quantitative, but they're not enough to begin solutioning on. 
if we start with a poor understanding of the problem space and our customer, we are forced to make assumptions to fill the gaps in our knowledge. And we don't know what we don't know. So we end up missing out on making an even better solution. I'll give you an example now. Analytics had shown us that our agricultural customers had a lower than expected adoption of our online business banking tools. So we set out to find out why. We decided to do some primary research in the field with our customers and also to talk to some staff members who uh, manage those customers to see what they had to say. We went out to talk to the staff first because we thought they might be able to give us some interesting insights into their customers before we went out. The staff had a really interesting theory that their customers were unable to adopt digital tools because they were just a little bit less technologically savvy. Of course, when we went out and actually talked to farmers, uh, well, they were very tech savvy. They had high-tech milking machines, automated egg collection, which I didn't know was a thing, and like, you know, they used a whole bunch of different tools online. The real issue is that they didn't perceive that digital banking tools to be worth their time and effort to invest in. Their farm work always comes before their book work, and our business banking tools hadn't been sold to them enough in a way that they didn't understand the value. They didn't understand why should I prioritize that over doing milking. Uh, cool. So how can we actually ensure that our thinking is thorough? We need to make sure we're moving systematically between the problem and solution space. And these two spaces require really different ways of thinking. We can use a concept linked back to ancient philosophy called logical reasoning. In modern academic research, there are two forms of reasoning commonly used to frame our thinking about things. These are called inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is coming up with theories based on data. So we start at the bottom and go up. We observe behaviors. We, we go and get data from surveys. We, we have all this data first. And then from there, we form patterns. We find the patterns and we can create hypothesis and maybe some larger theories. Inductive is bottom up. It's open-ended and exploratory. This is probably what you're familiar with in discovery research. Deductive reasoning, on the other hand, is testing theories through experiments. We start with a general theory, then we narrow it down to some hypothesis and to run experiments on those hypotheses. And then we can form a conclusion from that. Deductive reasoning is top-down. It's got a narrow focus. It's focused on proving or disproving something. In actuality, we need to think back and forth between these two models of reasoning to get the benefits from both. So give you an example in our agri-research. We started with induction. We collected data from customers, identified patterns, and developed a theory. The theory was that our agricultural customers were not aware of the online banking benefits for their business. Then we moved into deductive reasoning. We had a hypothesis that training staff on the benefit of online banking will be one thing that could increase our digital adoption for our agriculture customers. So we ran, we ran this experiment. We picked one pilot branch and we trained them up only. We tracked the outcomes with an analytics dashboard and it showed that adoption in that area increased as the training went on. So in conclusion, we did prove that that training did increase adoption of our online of our online banking for their agricultural customers. So we started with inductive reasoning, we used it to create a theory, and then we tested that theory to see if it was true using deductive reasoning. So when people ask us to just validate the solution, they are asking us to stay purely within that deductive reasoning area without doing any or starting with inductive. And this is a problem because we as humans are very, very bad at predicting our future needs. Imagining the future is a kind of nostalgia. We are always leaning on our previous life experience to guide what we want the future to be. We use our memory to predict the future. We remember what things felt like, and then we design experiences around that. I mean, that's obviously a problem because we're us and not our customers. Our experiences are different. And so if we don't start with this deep understanding of our customers, then we'll only be designing for ourselves, centered on our own past experiences and what we value. With no research to pull us out of this bias, 
we end up in a sort of a false problem space. We set these boundaries around it. It's very difficult to think outside of these false problem spaces once, uh, once we've got into them. We can almost never even see the actual problem space, which is nearby. And these false boundaries can feel more and more real the more we work within them. It becomes harder and harder to recognize our own biases as they become normalized. The actual problem space will also invariably overlap a little bit with the false problem space, as there's some obvious things to cover. And this can kind of give the illusion of validity to the solution first mentality. So we need to make sure that we're challenging these false problem spaces by questioning where our theories are coming from when we're creating solutions. Well, we're going to end up getting caught in a reasoning loop. We can go back and forth between creating solutions, running experiments, testing, testing all the time. I like to call this the validation treadmill because we're moving around and around, and oh boy, are we exercising our thinking muscles. But we're not going anywhere. We're just moving around within these false boundaries that we've created for ourselves. Validating the solution usually means usability testing the solution. And usability testing an assumption-based solution will only validate if your design is functioning well or not. But you're not validating if the problem is real. And you're certainly not learning more about your customers. The actual problem space will still be sitting over there, but you will never see it through the walls of assumptions that you've built up around yourself. Being on this treadmill can be exciting. It's fast-paced and it's fun, but you never really run beyond the original idea that you came up with. It's not a rigorous way of getting to a better solution. So going back to our online banking adoption, if we had solutioned of what the staff had told us, that their customers were just not very technologically savvy, then we would have had a really different outcome. We might have created some sort of tutorial for our online banking, and no amount of testing this tutorial would have told us that customers just didn't see the value of our online banking we would have run around perfecting this beautiful tutorial and never seen the outcomes that we wanted. So we, sh we should start with the problem. What solution could we have come up with if we had started from a place of deeper customer understanding? No more excuses. Let's convince stakeholders that UX research is valid research and we must start with the problem space in understanding our customers. So when people say to you, you know, the sample size is way too small, or you're just talking to some people, you say no. Qualitative discovery research is valid if you stop putting quantitative frameworks on top of it. And that validity in qualitative research necessitates high quality and rich data. And if they say, we can just start with a solution that I've already drawn, you can say, absolutely not. <laughs> we don't know if your theories of, where, of customers are based on ad hoc, ad hoc and anecdotal data. We need to make sure that we're using reasoning, thorough reasoning processes to counter our own biases and assumptions. And we must avoid the false problem space and the validation treadmills. Given one hour to save the planet, I would spend 55 minutes understanding the problem and five minutes resolving it. <laughs> 